Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today in uh, today's workshop on introduction to the copyright, uh, which is um, on copyright and publishing. And I'll start uh, by presenting a brief overview and then my colleague Hannah uh, will do the main session. And uh, uh, my name is Hina and I work as a senior research data officer uh, based at uh, University of Essex. And my colleague Gail is here as well to keep an eye on the technical side of the things. As I said earlier, um, in this session, uh, I'll just quickly go through what is meant by IP rights, and then Hannah will talk you through to the publishing and teaching in the context of copyright. So this um, copyright, just a bit of origin uh, in terms of um, copyright, um, the cornerstones of uh, modern copyright have their roots in ancient Greek, um, Roman and Jewish cultures, and it can be traced back as far as the sixth century in ancient Greece. But the world's first copyright law was the Statute of Ain. I hope I pronounce it uh, properly enacted in England in 1710. And this act introduced for the first time the concept of the author of a work being the owner of its copyright and it laid out fixed terms of protection. So that's the very quick origin of copyright. So uh, IP rights, these are the rights that are granted to creators of works that are the result of human intellectual creativity. Um, something that is creating uh, created using your mind, for example, a story, an invention, an artistic work or a symbol. And um, these IP rights include trademarks, uh, which is a type of intellectual property consisting of a recognizable sign, design or expression uh, that identifies uh, products um, or services of a particular source. Uh, from those of others and patents protect new inventions and um, registered design protects only the shape or appearance of a product. It gives its owner the exclusive right to the design of that product. And the final type is copyright, which is the protection offered for creative works such as um, books, music and literary works. And these IP rights uh, ensure that creators and inventors can protect and control the use of their creations. And uh, you get some type of protection automatically and for others you have to apply for. And as you are aware that we will be focusing on copyright uh, today. So just uh, to let you know that there is another uh, workshop coming up on 5th of November. Uh, which is around copyright issues in secondary data use. So you can have a look uh, on our events page to register for that if anyone is interested. And here is a QR code as well to register that you can use. And yeah, thank you very much. And I'll now hand over to Hannah. Okay, so thank you all for joining. Um, I'm Hannah Crago. I'm the Open Research Development Librarian, also based at the University of Essex. Um, and I'm going to be introducing you guys all to publishing today with particular focus on the first part, um, copyright in publishing, and the kind of things you need to keep in mind when you're publishing work around copyright. And the second part around copyright in teaching. Um, if you are doing any uh, teaching, then you need to be aware of um, copyright around teaching materials, uh, reading materials you might be making available on reading lists, those kind of things. So those two topics are going to form the first part of the session. And then we're going to go on to a bit more of an interactive part where together we're going to answer some common copyright questions um, because copyright can be quite a grey area and it is open to quite a lot of interpretation. Um, so we're going to kind of discuss some of those scenarios as well in that part. OK, so let's make a start with talking about copyright in publishing then. Um, so when you are publishing, when you're writing a manuscript um, that's going to be published, 
Um, generally, the publisher or the journal, if we're talking about a journal article, will expect you as the author to sort out all the clearance of any third party material and give any appropriate attributions that might be needed to the copyright owners of that third party material. So we're speaking here about um, substantial materials, so things like images, figures, tables, anything that you are reusing from another published work, um, you as the author will need to clear the, the uh, copyright for that reuse in your publication. So we're not talking here about using short quotations from another work, and um, this would follow the usual kind of referencing format that you'd be using in that publication. We're talking about substantial materials here. And the reason I wanted to start with this point um, around preparing your manuscript is to really highlight that it is important to consider copyright from the point of writing. Um, so if you're keeping this in mind while you're doing your research, while you're writing up your manuscripts, writing up your research, um, then you can make sure that you've got all the trails back to where you've got any third party material from. So you can check the licenses on that material and have all of that covered as you're going through, rather than when you get to the point of publication suddenly realising you need to go back and clear copyright for any of these materials um, because sometimes you might need to contact an author or contact a rights holder and you might even need to pay to use that material in yours and you don't want that to be delaying the publication of your work at that late stage of the process. Um, so do consider copyright from the very point of writing your, your manuscript or your research. Okay, so how... Um, you are actually publishing your research will affect the copyright decisions and the way that you are sharing your work. Um, so we're going to go through some of the different scenarios around different types of publication. Um, so we're thinking about subscription based journals, open access journals, hybrid journals, but also books and monographs um, and open access books and monographs as well, because the copyright implications will be slightly different um, depending on which of these you might be publishing. So for a subscription based journal, a journal where you would need to log in or pay to read the full text of the paper. Usually, if you're publishing an article in a subscription based journal um, through terms and conditions, you as the author will usually sign over the copyright to the publisher. And um, so you'll usually have a copyright transfer agreement that you'll sign um, on publication um, or on acceptance more, uh, more usually with the publisher that says you're happy to sign over the copyright of your work to the publisher. In those copyright transfer agreements, usually you as the author will keep the copyright to the author's accepted manuscript version of that paper. So the author's accepted manuscript or the AAM, that's the version of the paper that will be available after peer review. Um, so after all the, the peer review comments have been implemented, all the changes, it will be the final text, but it won't have all the kind of formatting, typesetting, copy editing that the journal will add afterwards. Um, so it won't have the, the header or the columns, you know, that the that publishers add on publication. So usually, as I say, you will own that author's accepted manuscript version. Um, so you'll sign the copyright transfer agreement that will sign over the version of record, but usually allows you to keep the copyright to the author's accepted version. But um, there might be restrictions that are stipulated in that copyright transfer agreement that affect what you're actually allowed to do with the content of the author's accepted version, even though you still own the copyright. And generally, this will be that the publisher is saying there must be an embargo period between the time of publication and when you're able to make the author's accepted version openly available. So, this will usually be anything from kind of three months up to even 24 months. It's usually three, six, 12 or 24 months after publication and that journals will try to stipulate that you are able to make the author's accepted version openly available. And I'm gonna come on, come on to that point in a little bit more detail in a moment. But I wanted to highlight at this point that um, even though there will generally be kind of standard copyright agreements that publishers will ask you to sign, um, often you would be able to request a change to the copyright agreement before you make you sign it. Um, and you could make changes that allow you to keep rights to the document or to potentially overcome um, the embargo period that they might be stipulating, those sorts of things. So.
you are well within your rights to try to negotiate these um, agreements. Don't feel like you just have to accept and sign anything that is presented to you. Um, please do read through, read through those agreements before signing anything um, and speak to um, kind of copyright advisors or uh, people at your institutions who can help with these sorts of things if you're unclear, um, because I know that they can sometimes be difficult to untangle. Um, and we do also get very used to in our lives being presented with lengthy terms and conditions that we just scroll to the bottom of, tick and accept, um, which I know I'm sure... I certainly do, and I'm sure lots of people here do do that, but I'd really encourage you when it comes to publishing your own work um, to be a bit more familiar with what you're actually signing and consider what it is that you're signing up to. Okay, in contrast to when you're publishing with a subscription journal, if you're publishing in an open access journal, so where the final text will be free to read and download, usually the author will keep all the rights to their work, um, and this will include the published version. So if you're publishing your paper open access, you as the author will generally keep the copyright to that paper um, and you will then be giving the journal a license to publish that work on your behalf. Um, so that's how it, how it differs with open access publishing. And it means that publishing open access not only has all the benefits of increased readership and increased access to your work, it also has the benefit of you having increased control over how that work can be shared and reused going forward. In hybrid journals that you, we see increasingly, um, a hybrid journal is a subscription-based journal, so you have to subscribe to access tabled content in that journal, but there will be an open access option for single articles. So if you are reading a hybrid journal, you'll notice that some content you need to log in to read and other content will be free to read and download without a login. Um, as an author for a hybrid journal, you'll see that when you come to um, when your paper has been accepted, you'll usually be given the choice over whether you want to pay to make your paper openly available or whether you want to publish behind a paywall. So in terms of copyright, what that means is if you're publishing open access within a hybrid journal, it will be the same situation as publishing in a fully open access journal where you would retain the rights to your um, final published version and a CC license, Creative Commons license, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide, um, will then be attached to that work. And as I say, all rights remain with the author. If you're publishing um, behind a paywall or traditionally um, within a hybrid journal, it will be the same as publishing in a general subscription journal. The copyright usually will be transferred to the journal. So a hybrid journal really is, as the name suggests, it basically just has those two options of whether you want to publish your paper open access or whether you want to publish it traditionally. And the copyright will be in, um, impacted depending on that choice that you make. Um, I've just seen a question in the chat. You don't understand how the author has agency to change any clause in the contract. As with book publishers you've experienced, they do not allow the author to change your own contract and said either accept the contract or go with a different publisher. Um, I'd say that's a, a really unfortunate um, situation that you've been in. Um, most publishers that I have dealt with around these kind of contracts um, for both monographs and journal articles would allow some um, some amendments. Obviously, they're not going to allow you to rewrite the entire contract and they might have legal guidelines that they need to stick to. Um, but particularly for books, actually, what I've experienced with lots of different authors is that monograph publishers and book publishers generally do allow changes within, within contracts. So I'd say it may be an uh, unfortunate situation you've had there. Of course, it does vary between publishers. All publishers will be different. And I would say also, it's always worth asking. Um, they can always say no. And there are obviously ways to ask these things as well. And hopefully, if you've got a good relationship with the, the publisher, they will be, even if the answer is, is no, it wouldn't be a case of accept or go with another publisher. And there'd be a bit more of a conversation around that. Um, Hopefully that answers the question, but obviously it does vary between publishers, so I can't speak for every scenario that might have happened. Okay, so I just wanted to speak now about uh, different Creative Commons licenses. So when you're publishing open access, and I put this here in the section on open access journals, but these licenses are applicable to any open access output. So if you're publishing a, a book or a monograph open access, 
um, or, or data, any anything you might be publishing open access, um, you would be assigning one of these Creative Commons licenses. Um, so these licenses have different elements that can be combined to bring different outcomes. Um, and you can take different parts of these to kind of make the license that works best for you and your work. So the first um, license, the, the licenses here are listed on the slide from top to bottom in order of kind of least restrictive to most restrictive. I haven't included the least restrictive license um, Creative Commons license on this slide, um, and that will be CC0 or um, what's known as a public domain license. The reason I haven't included that here is because CC0 is generally not used for academic publishing, um, because what that means is that work would be in the public domain, anyone could reuse it however they wanted to, and they wouldn't need to give any attribution to the copyright owner. Um, so that generally isn't used in academia, um, because the way academic publishing works, it's all about attribution and citations and those sorts of things. So. CC0 isn't really relevant here, but I thought I'd just mention it in case it's one you're familiar with or have come across before. In terms of academic publishing, though, the least restrictive and the most common license uh, for open access uh, publications would be CC BY or Creative Commons Attribution, as it's also known. And what this license allows is it means that reuse um, is allowed of the work as long as the author or the license holder gets credit. So that's why it's that attribution part. And that CC BY um, is the foundation of all of the other um, Creative Commons licenses. So you would start with CC BY, and then if you wanted to, you could add one, two, or three of the other three elements we've got here. So the second is CC BY SA, and SA stands for share alike. And this means that People that are using the work are allowed to distribute a modified version of the work, they can reuse the work, um, but it must be only under the same or a not more restrictive license as the original work. So it aims to prevent people from um, making a modified version of the work and then being more restrictive on how that version could be reused. That one also isn't too common within academia, but you do see it occasionally. Um, the elements that people tend to add more so, uh, particularly around um, PhD theses for the next one and, and monographs as well sometimes, is CC by NC, um, and the NC stands for non-commercial. So this means people can reuse your work, um, but only for non-commercial purposes. Um, so it still has the buy aspect, you still have to add the attribution, um, but it also means you're restricting how people might reuse it going forward and because they couldn't reuse it for a commercial purpose. As I say, this is quite often now used for PhD theses um, to prevent people kind of selling uh, a PhD thesis. Um, but I would say use this license with caution and um, because this is one that people are often quite keen to, to use, but it can restrict some uses that you might not want to have restricted. Um, so, for example, if someone wanted to present about your work at a conference in which they were being paid to present at, um, then that license would prevent them from doing that without asking your permission. So all of the license terms can be overridden if you were to contact the rights holder and ask for explicit permission to uh, do one of the uses that were being restricted by the license. And the final element is the ND element. So this is no derivatives, and that is the most restrictive because it means that yes, you can reuse the work, but only if you are not making any modifications. And again, in terms of um, what this might prevent people from doing, an ND license would prevent people from creating a translation of your work, for example, unless they asked for permission. Uh, I can see a question in the chat there on who owns copyright of a PhD thesis in the UK. Um, we are gonna get onto that later, but I'll give you a, a spoiler now. Um, Generally, it does vary between um, institutions, but generally at UK universities, it will be the PhD student themselves that owns the copyright to the PhD thesis. And that will be because a PhD student is a student at the university paying to be there. Um, so they generally would own the copyright to their PhD thesis. Um, in contrast, if you are a um, academic at a UK institution, again, generally, because it does vary by institution, generally, the university and um, will own the IP and um, not necessarily always the copyright. 
to any works produced during the terms of employment because you are then being paid to be there um, in contrast to a, a PhD student. Um, but I would really encourage you to check on the specific scenarios at your own institutions because it can vary. Um, and just looking at the Q&A, uh, you've heard some universities have sent letters to journals asserting that they hold the copyright to all their researchers' papers and that researchers no longer sign away their copyright and publishing with a journal. Is this true? Um, I'm going to talk about that on the next slide, Evelyn, which I believe is what you're asking about. So I will answer that verbally in a moment, but please do follow up with another question if I don't answer your question um, in as much detail as you're, as you're looking for. Um, and then Veronica in the Q&A, if I would write a blog as a private citizen on, for example, Facebook, who would hold the copyright and what kind of copyright would that be? Um, it will depend on the terms and conditions of the platform that you are writing it on. Um, sometimes it might be, and I don't know the specifics of Facebook as your example, it might be that when you have signed up to your Facebook account, um, you will have signed some terms and conditions that may or may not have said that any content you create on there is owned by Facebook. As I say, I don't know the particulars of that platform, um, but it would be a case of having to look into the agreement that you had signed with whichever platform you were writing on. Um, but generally, there'll always be some kind of moral rights over what you're, you're writing as well and posting on these places. Um, but you would need to look at the specifics. Uh, and the question there is corporate ownership situation different for a funded PhD student? Um, Again, sorry, it's a kind of, a, it depends. Potentially, it depends on the funder and the funder policy. I would say generally though, no. And generally it would still be the PhD student that would own the um, the thesis. But again, you would need to check specifically with your, the, or with the funder's um, agreement. But uh, generally um, it would still be the, the PhD student, I believe that would hold the, the copyright there. Okay. Um, let's move on to talk about um, rights retention. So this is kind of uh, in answer, and I think, or relevant to what Evelyn has asked in the Q&A. Um, so I mentioned earlier that when you're publishing in a subscription journal, um, often there are embargo periods, and often you have to wait after a certain amount of time to make your author's accepted version openly available, even though you would own the copyright to it. This is a problem um, or is increasingly becoming a problem because increasingly funders, um, research funders are asking for a media open access publication. And um, so if you are a funded researcher, you might be under, um, or you might need to make your um, research outputs immediately open access on publication. And even aside from funders policy, increasingly authors and institutions do want their work to be immediately open access on publication because of all the, the wide reaching benefits we see with open access in terms of equality, in terms of access, in terms of citations, all of these sorts of things. So one way to comply with funders um, policies around immediate open access, or indeed one way to just ensure you are getting immediate open access um, to your publications is to go for green open access with a zero month embargo period. So by this, I mean self-archiving that author's accepted version of your paper within a repository. It could be an institutional repository or a subject specific repository like archive or something along those lines, um, but with a zero month embargo period. So what we can see here is that if your funder or your institution, or just if you would like a zero month embargo period, there could be a mismatch there between that funder policy or your uh, institutional policy and what the journal's standard copyright policy would be um, if they are by default requesting a embargo period. So because of this mismatch, um, it was a complicated situation for authors if their funder was asking for a zero month embargo period, for example, and their journal was saying it had to be a six month embargo period. And this could put authors in quite a difficult situation um, where they were getting kind of uh, pulled both ways. So in order to combat that, what's known as rights retention has been developed um, to ensure that authors can um, retain control over how their authors accepted versions can be 
shared. So rights retention sounds quite complicated, but in basic terms, it's the implementation of this statement on any papers that you might be submitting to a journal. So when rights retention was first developed, um, what was recommended was that authors who didn't want an embargo period, who wanted to be able to immediately share their author's accepted version on publication, would add this statement you can see on the slide um, to their submission to a journal. So it would need to be on submission, not on acceptance. Um, it would need to be right at the beginning of the process, generally be added to a cover letter or a funding acknowledgement statement, that sort of thing, to say for the purpose of open access, the author has applied a CC BY, so Creative Commons Attribution, public copyright license to any author's accepted manuscript version arising from this submission. And this is what's known as a prior license because it means you are asserting your rights over that author's accepted manuscript before it even exists yet, because you will be putting this statement on there before the peer review, so before that author's accepted manuscript has been created. Um, and you will be licensing it CC BY. So the important thing with Creative Commons licenses is once you have placed a license on a work that um, can't be changed. So that author's accepted version will be licensed CC BY. And as we've just heard when we were discussing the different Creative Commons licenses, that means that you would be able to, or anyone, not just you as the copyright owner, anyone would be able to share and reuse that work um, however they wished, as long as they were giving attribution to the copyright owner. And that would include um, making it publicly available via a repository. So what this does, because it's a prior license, is it means it overrules any kind of agreements that publishers or journals might be trying to um, I was gonna make, I'm not for want of a better word, um, authors sign when they are publishing their work. So this provides a really good backstop for authors because it means that no matter how they're publishing their work, they can still make that author's accepted version immediately open access via a repository, um, meaning there is always a version of your paper immediately available open access on publication, which is really good for funder compliance, and um, it's really good for uh, ref compliance, and it's really good just for the general accessibility of your paper. Um, I can see some questions coming through. Um, I'm going to come back to that question um, in the chat, Jasleen, about uh, books, because we're going to talk about books in a moment. Um, Teresa, the question, is there ever a case where the publisher will not allow this prior license? Um, that's a good question and one we get asked quite regularly. Um, a publisher couldn't not allow the license in that they can't undo that. A publisher could, of course, reject a paper. Um, if they didn't want to publish a paper where the author's accepted version was going to be made openly available, um, they could do that. What we've seen, though, and not just we, Essex, I mean, we across UK higher education, where rights retention has really been growing in the past few years, is that publishers aren't rejecting papers based on, on seeing this licence. Um, they might not always be happy about author's accepted versions being shared openly, um, but ultimately, if they were to reject all papers that were asserting this right, they wouldn't necessarily have many papers left to publish, and um, certainly not from UK authors because it really is growing across the UK. Um, so they kind of don't really have too much of a choice. What is more common um, than papers being rejected based on this is sometimes a publisher might try to encourage an author to submit their paper to a different journal. So they might try and redirect a, a submission from a subscription or a hybrid journal to a fully open access journal and then the author would need to pay to make it openly available by publishing in that fully open access journal. So that is more the response we've seen from publishers. Um, but generally, um, that this is just, it's having to be accepted because there's not really any other way around it. Um, I can see a question in the Q&A as well. Uh, yes, other CC licenses could be put in the statement, um, Amy. Uh, yes, yeah, so it wouldn't need to be CC BY. Um, the reason it is CC BY is because this statement was originally developed by research funders um, through uh, what's known as Coalition S, a group of research funders, and um, includes UKRI and Wellcome, for example. Um, and those funders do require CC BY. Um, so if you are using right retention for funder compliance, I would check what license your funder 
might require um, because it's likely to be CC by. Um, okay. I'm just going to come back briefly to Evelyn's original question around some universities sending letters to journals asserting that they hold the copyright to all of their researchers' papers and that researchers no longer sign away their copyright when publishing with the journal. So what you're referring to here, I think, is institutional rat retention policies. So I've mentioned that when rat retention was first developed, it was encouraged by publishers, um, sorry, not by publishers, by funders, um, that authors add this statement to make that kind of easier and also to kind of bring a more um, holistic approach to rights retention. Lots of UK higher education institutions are now developing or have already developed institutional rights retention policies. Uh, this is something that here at Essex we have launched as of the first of this month. Um, and what that means is we have contacted all of the publishers that we know our authors publish with um, fairly regularly. Um, basically, I think we did, we contacted any journal publisher that an Essex author had published with three times or more um, in the past five years, but it will vary between institutions. But anyway, so institutions will contact publishers to tell them that um, they've got an institutional policy that means we as an institution are giving our authors the right to retain copyright on their authors accepted versions and openly license them CC BY. So it means that we have done that prior license for our authors. So uh, researchers aren't having to remember to add this statement. Um, we still do encourage um, researchers to add this statement just for kind of full transparency with the publisher. But on a legal basis, um, we have already um, given that prior license. So it means any papers that are published by Essex authors at any of the publishers we have contacted, um, we can make the author's accepted version immediately available open access via our institutional repository without having to worry about different uh, journal policies for embargoes or anything like that. And meaning our authors can share their author's accepted manuscripts on social media or email them to their colleagues or share them in whichever way they might choose to um, to increase the visibility of their work. So um, the point you said, Evelyn, about asserting that they own the copyright to all their researchers' papers, um, I'd say that varies. Uh, for some institutions, it might be that the institution is asserting the ownership of the, the copyright. For others, it might be that they are giving their authors the right to, to own their copyright. Um, at Essex, uh, the institution owns the IP, but the, the authors own the copyright. And um, so it does just depend, but um, that's that's generally the premise around institutional rights retention policies. And this is really growing across the UK. As I say, I think there's more than 30 institutions now that have these institutional rights retention policies. And it might be that some of you here today um, are, are very aware of these if they're already in place at your institution. OK, so that's quite a lot of information on rights retention. And um, so I'm going to move on now to talk about publishing books and um, because we have been speaking um, primarily about journal articles so far. Um, so if you're publishing a book or a monograph, um, generally the publisher will ask the author to assign certain rights. Um, so this can generally be done in, in three different ways um, if you are not publishing a book openly. Um, so where journals do tend to have quite standard terms and conditions for publishing, the books and monographs um, agreements do vary a bit more between publishers and between publications, even with the same publisher. Um, so even more important to please read your copyright agreements before signing when publishing a, a book or a monograph. But generally, there's three main main ways that this works. Um, the first is that you would simply assign the copyright to the publisher and the publisher would now own the work. Um, but the author would usually get royalties or payment and that would also be laid out. In that, in that contract. You might also assign exclusive rights to the publisher. So this would be where you as the author would keep the copyright, um, but you would be giving the publisher an exclusive right to publish that work. So you wouldn't be able to publish or disseminate the work elsewhere um, because you have given that publisher the exclusive right to publish that work on your behalf and um, with you still as the copyright owner. Or there might be non-exclusive rights, which, which is where 
similar to exclusive rights in that you keep the copyright and you're giving a publisher a license to publish it on your behalf. Um, usually though with non-exclusive rights, you'd still be able to disseminate the work um, in different ways and in different places as the copyright owner, but wouldn't usually be able to republish the work and um, kind of a more formal republishing of the work with a different publisher. But open access books or open access monographs, it's kind of the same concept as open access journals. Um, so you will be reading through your, your copyright agreement um, and you would be assigning a Creative Commons license to that monograph or that book um, that would be uh, recommended by the publisher or the license that you, you would like to choose. And I'd say my experience with working with authors who are publishing open access monographs is generally the publisher will allow the author to choose the Creative Commons license that they would like to, um, even if there might be one that is their standard kind of recommended license. Um, the publication of open access monographs is somewhat behind open access journal articles, but funders are now asking for open access monograph publishing as well. And so if you are a UKRI funded author, for example, and you're publishing a monograph that acknowledges UKRI funding, it does now need to be made available open access. Um, for UKRI, there is uh, an up to 12 month embargo period permitted for monographs, um, which isn't permitted for journal articles. Um, so it could mean that you are depositing, making your work openly available via a repository, um, but generally um, it would be um, the kind of immediate open access of the, the whole monograph um, if it is funded. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to talk about about publishing. Then we are going to come back to some of these concepts later again in the in the questions in the second part of the session. Um, but I'm going to speak a bit now about copyright implications when it comes to teaching. Um, because if you are doing teaching, copyright does affect what can be used in your teaching materials, so things like your lecture slides and um, all of that sort of thing, but also what can be included on online reading lists. So when it comes to um, UK higher education, um, the license there is a, a license, a collective license that is used or um, by most, uh, well not necessarily most, but by lots of institutions, and that would be the CLA license for higher education. So that's the Copyright Licensing Agency license. Um, lots of institutions do have this license, some don't, so I'd recommend finding out what you have at your institutions. But if you are covered by the CLA license, this license allows you to copy from books, journals and magazines. Um, so it makes it easier for um, people who are using resources for education um, to reuse content. So for materials that are covered by the license, and not all books, journals and magazines will be, but lots will be, um, under the terms of the license, you can use up to 10% or one chapter of a work, whichever is greater. Um, or if we're talking about journal articles, you can use one article from each issue of each journal under the terms of this license. The terms of the license also stipulate that copies can only be shared with students or staff. And um, so generally to enable that to happen, um, these scans that are made or the copies that are made under the terms of the license will usually be made available via an online reading list system like uh, Talis Aspire, for example, or um, Aganto, or um, they might be made available via a virtual learning environment like Moodle or Blackboard and um, that sort of thing. But generally they will be password protected um, so that only students and staff can access them. Also under the terms of the license, reporting is required of all materials that are copied under the license. Um, so all digital copies made um, have to be reported. And again, generally that is done um, via kind of uh, online reading systems is the most common way um, that that's done. Okay. Um, Another license that is available to help with um, teaching within the UK is the ERA license, so the Educational Recording Agency license, also for higher education. Um, and this enables staff and students to record or make copies of, of programmes for educational use. Um, so the educational use part is really important here. Um, you can't be making copies just for entertainment um, and certainly not for any kind of commercial activities. Um, and again, materials can't be shared on public platforms 
And so will generally be made available on virtual learning environments uh, or embedded in, in lecture slides that aren't shared openly, that sort of thing. Um, again, not all institutions do have an ERA licence. Um, if you do, um, it does allow you to subscribe to um, Box of Broadcast, um, which is something we have available here at Essex. Um, and it, Box of Broadcast enables many kind of TV programmes and films that have been broadcast in the UK. Um, to, made, uh, to be made available, um, again, for educational purposes. Um, okay. You can just see some more questions, but they're kind of touching on previous um, points, so I'll come back to those at the end. In terms of outside of those licences then, so we've spoken about the CLA licence and the ERA licence, but there are also um, copyright exceptions built into UK copyright law that are specifically for, um, for teaching. Um, so the most relevant of this would be um, section 32, which is known as illustration for instruction. So where the sharing of materials isn't covered by one of those licenses, or if your institution doesn't have those licenses we've spoken about, um, we can refer to copyright exceptions um, to enable broader reuse of works um, where it is for the purpose of education. Um, so. Under this copyright exception, as it says on the slide, materials can be used where the sole purpose is instruction. Um, so it, this really refers to where there's a non-commercial use that is purely for instruction and has sufficient acknowledgement. As with lots of things with copyright exceptions, this is somewhat open to interpretation. Um, and we kind of have to ask ourselves what we kind of term as the usual fair dealing questions. So things like, is it a non-commercial use? This seems really straightforward, um, but we are charging our students to come to universities in the UK. Um, so can we really call this a non-commercial use? The general consensus is yes, and we are able to make use of this copyright exception in, at universities and um, because we are running on a not-for-profit basis, so it isn't seen as a commercial use in quite the same way. Um, there's also the kind of point around for instruction. Um, so to make use of this exception, it does use, need to be for instruction. So this is sometimes interpreted just as for in-class materials. So when you're actually there instructing someone, delivering a lesson. Um, but the general agreement in recent years has been that online platforms like reading lists or virtual learning environments are an essential part of teaching and therefore are an extension of the classroom. And this exception is therefore relevant in those situations as well. Um, but we do have to ask ourselves, is what we're copying directly relevant to what is being taught? Um, are we reproducing kind of an unreasonable proportion of the original? Um, it should be really just a, a targeted portion you might be copying to make use of this exception that is kind of fundamental for that instruction. Um, the copying can't be used as a replacement for purchasing additional copies. And um, so it should just be kind of short extracts really. Um, we the reuse wouldn't be able to be potentially damaging to the interests of the copyright owner in any other way. Um, and we would need to be acknowledging the author and the source adequately. That's quite a lot of information there and all of these are kind of a, a judgment call. Um, so what we generally say when we're thinking about making use of copyright exceptions is a really good rule of thumb is to put yourself in the position of the owner of the copyright. So we've already spoken today about when you're publishing your work. If you imagine it's one of your um, publications as being reused for teaching. Think about whether you'd be happy with your work being used in that way. If the answer is yes, um, you can kind of feel quite happy that it's probably a fair use. Um, if the answer is no, and you maybe wouldn't be happy with your work being used in that way, then likely the, the copyright owner wouldn't be either. Um, but again, I'd really recommend if you are thinking about using any copyright exceptions to make more materials available to your students, and um, speak to corporate advisors or, or staff at your institutions who work in these kind of areas. Um, we do generally within our teams here at Essex discuss amongst ourselves and um, because for these corporate questions, it is often useful um, to have that kind of uh, back and forth and a few different opinions there. Okay, let me just have a quick eye on the Q&A. Uh, the copyright exception, does it extend to audio and video materials? Uh, yes, uh, I yes, uh, it does. So copyright exceptions can extend to different kinds of materials and um, not just uh, written materials. 
I'm um, just looking at Veronica's question. Do you as also have any rights when the publisher decides not to publish after signing the agreement? Um, I'm not sure entirely what you mean. Do you still have any rights when the publisher decides not to publish after signing the agreement? As in, you've signed a copyright agreement, but then the publisher decides not to publish the work. Um, if that's what you mean, then I don't think that that situation would really arise in that you wouldn't be signing a copyright agreement and unless the work was going to be published. So it would be unusual that the publisher would decide not to publish after signing the agreement. But if I've misunderstood that question, um, I will have my email address at the end and feel free to drop me an email after. Um, there's also quite a long question here from an anonymous attendee in the Q&A. Um, I will probably get back to that one also via email if you're happy to email me just because it is quite a long one, but we'll see how much time we have at the end. Okay, so what I want to do now is I think it will probably have become clear so far that copyright isn't always straightforward, but that, that there are um, things in place that we can uh, rely on, that we can know are, are definitely true or not true. Um, so what I wanted to do for the remainder of the session is go through some common copyright questions that we get asked quite a lot or that we are dealing with quite a lot um, and that I think will be relevant to people here today so that we can kind of see what, what our um, consensus would be on these questions and what we might think to those answers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a different question on each slide and share a poll. And in the poll, I just want you to write uh, to answer yes, no, or it depends um, to the questions. And then we can have a bit of a discussion. Um, please do write in the chat any thoughts that you have around the answers to the questions. So any of the rationale um, as to why you've answered the way that you have answered. Um, and we can get a bit of a discussion going there as well. So the first question then is, do I own the rights to my PhD thesis? Um, so you should see now a chance to answer on the slide. Um, so the answer, you can vote either yes, no, or it depends. So what do you think? Do I own the rights to my PhD thesis? I'll just give you a second to answer that. Okay, so we had a bit of a split um, between yes and it depends. Um, so I guess the way I phrase this question, do I own the rights to my PhD thesis? You might be answering yes because you know what the position is at your institution, in which case you might very well be right. Um, but generally, um, I would say it depends because it does depend on the institution you're at. But in most cases, as I already discussed earlier when I said there was a bit of a spoiler for later, um, generally, in UK universities, PhD students do own the rights to their PhD thesis, um, as we, we've already discussed, so I won't, won't go into this one in any more detail. So the next question, um, can I use images I don't own in my PhD thesis? Um, so you're, you're writing a PhD thesis and there are images that you don't own, um, can you use them in your PhD thesis? So again, just a yes, no, or it depends. Very welcome to put any uh, rationale for your answers in the chat as well. Okay, um, so this time most people have gone with it depends. Um, I would say the answer here is yes. Um, so well done to the, the four yeses. Um, and this is really because there is a copyright exception for education and research within UK copyright law. And um, that means that you can use a reasonable amount um, of a third party material um, in something that is for education and research, as long as it is properly cited. Um, because of that exception, a PhD thesis is there for educational purposes. And so you can use third party materials more freely in these kind of works than others. So yes, Mary, with permission and attribution, um, no problem, Teresa. Okay, the next question then, in contrast to what I've just said potentially, uh, can I use, can I include the images I used in my research in my publication? 
So let's imagine you are now going on to publish that PhD thesis um, and there are images there that you used in your PhD thesis, but now you want to publish that work. So uh, the question in the chat, so you don't need to get permission for images that are not fair use in PhD. Um, for your PhD thesis, as long as you are giving proper attribution and you are not using a kind of, um, and you're using a, a suitable amount of a third party work. So if you're just using one image, for example, from a third party material um, and you're using it in your PhD thesis alone, uh, you wouldn't need to get permission to use it as long as you're properly attributing it because of that exception. Um, that question, around, the difference with this though, is that if you are publishing that, then you would absolutely need permission to publish um, the, an image you don't own or any any content you don't own um, because then it's not just it, the exception there for education and research doesn't apply because it isn't just for education then. A PhD thesis is used as a way of assessing a um, PhD. As soon as you go to publish that, um, it then becomes a publication in and of itself and therefore the general rules for publication will apply where you need to clear the copyright for that work. And that is why often um, it's recommended that you do clear the copyright for images you're using in PhD theses anyway, because very often they are published after in one form or another. Um, so good practice. I would really recommend always um, making sure that the images or any third party material you're using um, are either openly licensed. So they have a CC license that means you're able to use them in your work or you've gone and got permission directly from the copyright owner. Um, but if you are just including them in your thesis and you are not going to be publishing that thesis, the copyright exception for education and research would apply. If journals are classified as education and research, you don't need image permissions like a PhD thesis. Um, so no, once you're publishing a journal article, that wouldn't be classed under the education and research um, exception it's it's where you're purely using it for research purposes and um, so if you were just using it to research something but then not publishing the, that part of your research then it would be okay um yeah so exactly madeline if the university is later going to publish your phd um as an open access thesis you would need to clear the rights for it so that's why i'm saying generally um we would always recommend people do um use openly licensed uh third party materials or um, get that permission, um, even though technically if it wasn't going to be published, it would fall under that exception. Okay, um, I see someone in the Q&A. How can I ask my institution about the copyright ownership of my PhD thesis and can I request that my PhD thesis not be published as the copyright holder? Um, get in touch with your um, kind of uh, probably your library or your repository team um, or um, maybe the postgraduate um, kind of office, the PG office at your institution um, and they should be able to give you the institutional policy on PhD thesis. You might be able to find it online as well. Um, and uh, generally you probably could request that your PhD thesis isn't published. Um, you can, at Essex at least, our um, PhD students can request an embargo period on their thesis, or they can request that it is, is never openly shared. However, at Essex at least, we do discourage that um, because it is really good for, for people um, to be able to read your, your thesis and um, for it to be shared openly. Um, and I should also say that generally, if you're publishing a PhD thesis in that, you're making that thesis as it as it is, as you wrote it for your, for your um, submission as a thesis. If you're making that openly available via a repository, for example, generally that won't prevent you from publishing based on your thesis, a journal article that would be heavily based on the thesis later. And so generally journal publishers don't see a PhD thesis being made openly available via a repository as equivalent to another publication. And um, so I wouldn't recommend not um, sharing your thesis, I guess, unless there's a, a good reason not to. Um, and that answers the, the final question as well. Um, 
where you say um, you don't need to clear permissions for images if the image is a fair use, the term fair, fair use is a, an, an American uh, copyright term. And um, so we don't have fair use here in the UK in the same way. Um, but if you mean you don't need to clear permissions for images if they are openly licensed. So if it's a CC licensed image, um, then no, you don't need to clear permission to use any Creative Commons um, licensed images but you do need to abide by the terms of that image's license. So if it's CC0, um, you wouldn't need to do anything. If it's CC BY, um, you would just need to give attribution to the copyright owner. If it was CC BY ND, for example, you would need to give the attribution, but not make any derivative work. So basically you, you just have to abide by the terms of that license. And um, so if it's a, an openly licensed image, um, make sure you fully understand the license that it has been given. Okay. Um, let me go on to the next question. Um, so can I reuse content from work I have published before? So if you have published a paper previously, um, can you reuse um, aspects from that previously published paper in a future publication. Give you a couple more seconds. Okay. Um, so we've got quite a split here. So we've got uh, 14 yeses, 15 it depends, and six noes. Um, I would say it's it depends again, um, because it depends on whether you still own the copyright or not. Um, so if you've published a paper open access previously, and you are therefore still the copyright owner of that work, then you can reuse um, content from that work in a future publication. If you have signed over the copyright to um, your publisher, um, then you would need to get permission to reuse that content as you would any other work that you haven't authored. Um, so that's another um, knock-on effect of signing over the copyright to a publisher. Um, in either cases, though, whether you're the copyright owner or not of the previously published work, um, you still need to self-cite um, to give that attribution to the previously published work. Okay, um, similar question. Um, can I reuse figures from my published work in my future work? So talking here about kind of graphs, tables, and um, that sorts of thing. Any any figures you've created that have been um, included in a in a journal article potentially that you published previously, and now you want to publish an, a new publication, maybe a, a book chapter or another journal article using one of those figures. Okay, so we've got mostly it depends. So yes, agree, it would depend. And it's the same as the previous question. It still depends on whether you own the copyright to that previously published work. The reason I've separated this as a separate question is that when it comes to figures, um, there are things you can do to ensure that you can still reuse them going forward. So say if you created a figure or a model or something that you might want to use um, in multiple places in the future, and um, you might want to use it in conference presentations or in future journal articles, for example. You can, before you publish a paper with that figure in, you could publish that figure alone in somewhere like Figshare, um, and it would then be a work in and of itself. Um, you could license that work openly, it could be uh, whichever CC license you, you choose, um, and you would be the copyright owner of that figure. That would then mean that you could then use that figure in any of your future publications or any of your future work, even if that figure got published in a journal article that you signed the rights for that article over to a publisher. So it's all about thinking about these layers of copyright and what we're actually classing as a as an individual work here. Uh, so it wouldn't be self plagiarism, Louise, as long as you were citing your um, previously published work um, and Again, just with any kind of plagiarism, you weren't using a kind of a substantial amount of that work. I'm not saying please copy 
paragraphs and paragraphs from one journal article, use them in the next journal article and just uh, cite yourself because that would then be self-plagiarism. But if you're just using small extracts or ideas or um, kind of concepts from previously published work um, and you, you're reciting, um, that would be fine. And again, if you're using kind of an image or a figure, that sort of thing, and you're reciting, it wouldn't be self-plagiarism. Okay, the next one. So thinking a bit more about teaching. Um, can I put my reading materials on a virtual learning environment? So thinking that uh, you have made a scan of a chapter and you're making it available via a virtual learning environment, for example, Moodle, and for your students to read. Okay. Uh, so we've got mostly yes and quite a lot of it depends and a couple of no's. Um, again, the yes and no's might be answering based on your institutions, um, but generally the answer would be it depends. So it varies by institutions. Um, if you've got a, a copyright licensing agency license at your institution, a CLA license, um, it could be that the answer is yes. But generally, um, people using a CLA license will be making their reading materials available via an online reading list platform. And um, because those platforms tend to allow for reporting of those scans to the CLA, um, that allows them to be sure that those scans are compliant with the license. Um, but it might be at your institution that um, copies are made available via virtual learning environments. Um, it will just depend what you are um, what your institutional policy and processes are. But the important point to remember is if there is a CLA license in place, though all of those scans will need to be reported to the CLA on an annual basis. And um, so it couldn't just be that you would make a scan and email it or something along those lines where there wouldn't be a mechanism for reporting. Okay, um, next one. Uh, I wrote the chapter so I can do whatever I like with the full text. So you've written a book chapter uh, and now you want to share it with your students, email it to them, um, put a scan on your reading list, um, whatever, whatever you, you see fit for using that chapter for education with your students. Uh, okay, um, I've got people catching on to how much the answers with copyright are, it depends. Uh, yes, this would depend, as with all the previous um, questions on similarly around this, depends whether you own the copyright or not. So that is still the case when it comes to using your publications for teaching, um, even though it might seem frustrating if you've written a chapter that is perfect for your module. Um, if you don't own the copyright to that chapter, it will have to be treated in exactly the same way as the chapter you hadn't written. Um, because it is all about who owns the copyright there. Um, it's freely available online, uh, so I can do I can share it with my students. So you found a resource that's freely available online, um, and you want to share it with your students for their uh, seminar reading uh, for a class. more seconds. Okay, so it depends. Yes, it would depend. Um, if it's a legitimately open access uh, material, an academic paper that's been published open access, yes, you can use it with your students, share it with your students. Um, however, not everything that is freely available online is legitimate. Um, so if something has been illegally uploaded online, um, we wouldn't be openly directing our students to these sources. Obviously, um, we cannot police the internet. That's not to stop students being able to find those materials, but um, we would need to be directing to resources that were 
legitimately um, made available online. Um, it's only a few pages, um, so it's fine to scan and share. So you've got a, a book on your shelf, uh, you want to, your students to read a couple of pages of the book, um, so it's fine to scan and, and share that, so it's just a small amount. Okay, so a, a mixed answer here, and this is a more difficult one. Um, this is really thinking back to that copyright exception that I mentioned earlier. Um, so it can be legitimate um, because when we're thinking about that copyright exception around uh, for illustration for instruction, um, we would be asking ourselves those questions around fair dealing and is it uh, directly relevant to the instruction? Um, is if it's just a couple of pages, we could probably say it isn't being scanned as an alternative to purchasing the whole work and um, because it is just one or two pages. Um, and it's it's kind of that thing of putting yourself in the shoes of the copyright owner. And generally, when we're thinking about that copyright exception, well, it doesn't say in the exception itself a percentage. The kind of common agreement is that up to 5% of a work is generally um, seem to be a fair use of the work. Um, so it's it's a bit of a, a judgment call, but if it is only a few pages, it is likely to be more okay to scan and share it purely for the purpose of um, education. Okay, uh, just a couple more of these to go. Um, so it's very old, so copyright doesn't apply. Oh, I haven't uh, launched the poll, sorry. There we go. So yeah, it's, it's very old, so the copyright doesn't apply. Okay, so this one depends, again, uh, it depends on how old it's very old. Uh, in the UK, and these laws do vary between um, countries quite significantly, um, but in the UK, uh, a, a kind of written publication is termed to be out of copyright 70 years after the author's death. Um, so yeah, for written works in the UK, they're no longer copied by, covered by copyright law 70 years after the author's death. Um, but that does vary for different kinds of materials. Um, so, for example, broadcasts um, in the UK are protected for 50 years from the date the broadcast was made. Um, so it does depend on the, the type of work and the country um, that you are in and also the country of publication. Um, so when materials are no longer covered by copyright, they tend to be in the public domain. Uh, but another thing to remember with that is that will just be the original text. So, for example, the original text of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice um, is no longer in copyright. It has been much more than 70 years since the author's death. So that text is out of copyright. However, uh, the Penguin third edition of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice is not out of copyright. That is a, a print book in and of itself. It's a work on, on its own. That isn't out of copyright. But what it means is that because the original text is out of copyright, um, a film of Pride and Prejudice, for example, can be made without having to get permission from anyone because the original text is out of copyright. Um, so it does just depend on that. Uh, I've run this session lots and lots of times now, and I can say that not once has someone failed to mention Peter Pan. Um, so Keith in the chat, yes. Peter Pan in perpetual copyright. Um, kind of. As far as I understand it, uh, what happened is that... Uh, the author of Peter Pan gave copyright um, to um, Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, so it means that any any royalties that come from um, that go go towards um, Great Ormond Street Hospital. So you can 
um, assign copyright. And if you assign copyright to uh, someone that isn't going to die, I guess, um, as soon as it's 70 years after the, the author's death, um, then it, it affects the way that copyright works. So yes, um, Peter Pan is a, is a special case. Um, so a, a different situation there. Yeah, there's lots of information about it online. It's very, uh, very famous uh, in copyright circles. Okay, um, this is the last question. Um, and it might seem a bit of a, a blasé one, but um, no one will know and it will help my students. So it's fine to use. We've got a bit more consensus on this one than lots of the others. Okay, so we've got all but one person saying no. So yes, the answer here would be no. Um, and the reason I put this up here, I, I know it's an obvious, obvious question, but I just wanted to really reiterate the point that in the session today, we've looked at copyright from two different perspectives. We've looked at it from the perspective of being a copyright owner, uh, a creator of a creative work. Um, and we've, we've thought about it in terms of our publications. We then thought about it from the other side in terms of a copyright user and people that are using copyrighted works in their teaching. And I think that really speaks to copyright in general in that all of us are copyright creators, copyright owners, and also copyright users. And so being able to see both sides of this um, is, is really important for when it comes to making copyright decisions and making those judgments because there are quite a lot of gray areas and quite a lot of interpretation there. Um, but think about when you're using copyrighted works, think about if you had created the work if you were the creator of that work, because copyright is there to protect creative works, you would want others to respect your work. Um, and so we want people to be respecting copyrighted works of others in the same way. Um, in kind of really, not crude, but quite kind of, yeah, crude terms, uh, if we think about it in terms of metrics, um, if you aren't using legitimate versions of people's work. It can affect their metrics in terms of downloads and views, and they don't know who or how many people are, are using their work. When we think about academic papers, for example, um, on a kind of institutional level, um, there are institutional risks. Um, if there was broad um, kind of incorrect use of copyrighted works, so while the individual risks might be quite low, and there could be quite serious reputational and financial ramifications on a university level if there was a wide misuse of copyrighted works. Um, but I think more than those kind of two basic measures, it is that kind of thing of um, copyrighted work. Copyright is there for a reason. Copyright is there to be an enabler of creativity. It's there to protect the creators and to enable people to create and get the recognition they deserve but also to put assign those licenses that allows their work to be reused in the way that they want it to be. So copyright gives um, creators control, just like rights retention gives authors control of how their papers are, are used, assigning a different Creative Commons license enables you as the creator to say, yes, I'm happy for people to use my work for this reason, but maybe not that reason. Um, so respect those licenses and respect the creators behind those works. Um, and when we see copyright in that way is kind of a, an enabler of the sharing that the creator wants rather than a frustrating restriction on use. Um, I think that we can kind of see copyright in the way that it was intended to be. So that's everything I wanted to talk through with you today. Um, thank you for sticking with it. As I know, there's been a lot of content and quite a lot of um, kind of technical things. Um, so if anyone has any questions, thoughts or ideas, please do feel free to ask them now in the in the Q&A or the chat and um, but please do also feel free to get in touch my email address is there um, and you can connect with me on LinkedIn as well if that's helpful um, I know there are a few questions that have been unanswered and um, some of them were potentially too long to go through in detail but if there is anything really pressing that anyone wants me to answer now please do put it in the Q&A just seeing one from Martha if you quote from a letter from an archive when the author has not been dead 70 years, you still have to seek permission from a relative. Yes, that's correct, yeah. If the author hasn't been dead 
70 years, then you would have to seek permission from the, the copyright owner, which usually would be a relative unless they had assigned copyright to someone else. Um, just going back to the longer questions earlier. Um, going back to the potential copyright transfer under the subscription route, do you happen to know what is the case with figures, tables, diagrams? For example, can a user ask permission from the original author to reuse a figure from their AAM instead of asking permission from a publisher to reuse the item from the VOR? That's a good question. Um, yes, I think that they would be able to do that. Um, I think that you would be able to get permission from the, the author who has rights over the author's accepted version, especially if that author's accepted version has been shared openly via a repository, for example, you would then just need to cite the author's accepted version rather, rather than the final version of record um, if you wanted to reuse that version. Um, there's another one, you came across an article some time ago where it said copyright as in the symbol, which means all rights reserved, authors for permission, contact the publisher at. This looked a bit contradictory to me that the author is recognised as copyright owner, but for permission, the publisher would need to be contacted. Any thoughts on my publishers might use this and what it means in practice for the original authors? This is quite a strange one because the way that the copyright statements present themselves, particularly on, on academic papers, is sometimes confusing. Um, so it might be that the copyright owner is the author, but there might be exclusive rights of the publisher for reuse. Um, so kind of like I was saying with books where you might be the copyright owner, but you've given the publisher an exclusive license. It might be that there's a license there that means that reuse has been restricted to just that publisher. Um, so in which case you need to contact the publisher um, um, for reuse, but it, it can be a bit uh, confusing sometimes um, with the way those are presented. But you will see that generally the copyright statements will say, copyright with the authors or CC by the authors um, rather than the institution, for example, even if the institution were to own the IP. And um, so it does just depend on the kind of specific license terms. Um, and then the final question from that set of three, in your experience with negotiating publishing contracts, what were the most common changes of terms for journals or book contracts? Um, I would say that I don't have that much experience of journal contracts being changed if I'm being completely honest um, but around book contracts, the most common change would be around basically changing it from a um, a paywalled book to like a book that's available to purchase to the online version being openly available. And very often it will be that there is just a contract change for the the ebook, and um, so the ebook will no longer have terms around kind of royalties that sort of thing because the ebook will be openly licensed CC BY for example. Um, but the contract will stay the same for any print copies sold um, where the, the publisher usually still owns the copyright of that version and um, with royalties going to the author. And um, so that would be the main change um, around book contracts that I've seen, but it's probably um, because of the, the role that I do. Um, there are probably other changes that are made. I expect probably some authors uh, negotiate around the amount of royalties they do receive, um, potentially um, other other kind of conditions like that. Um, so they would be the general ones. Um, please, can you answer my question you asked in chat earlier and does the author retain copy? If people have put questions earlier in the chat, it's really hard to find them. Um, so please, could you add them to the Q&A instead? Um, yes, uh, does the author retain copyright of material submitted? even though he cancels the contract and published it elsewhere. Yes, I think if I'm understanding that question correctly, so does the author retain copyright material submitted, even though he cancels the contract and published it elsewhere? Yes, so usually um, you wouldn't have, uh, until you've signed something that assigns the copyright over um, to a publisher, you would still own the copyright as the creator. So if it's gone through peer review, but you haven't signed anything to say you're assigning that paper over to the publisher yet, you would still own the copyright to that um, if it doesn't get published, because it would normally only be on publication that you'd sign those copyright transfer agreements. Um, so you'd then be able to take the, 
the text and submit it to another journal. And that wouldn't normally be a problem. One thing I will say here is that be careful with um, predatory publishers or fake journals, um, because often they might ask you to sign something very early in the publication process to sign the rights over to that publisher um, and then potentially pay to publish it open um, openly as well. Um, and then that can often be problematic for if it turns out that it's not a legitimate journal and you then want to submit it somewhere elsewhere and you've already signed it over to the publisher, that's when it can be a problem. Um, another question here. I'm doing a practice-based PhD in music composition. My portfolio includes works for voice where I have set literary text that is still under copyright. In each case, I've used under 100 words per author. Do I need to come back? Um, I'm going to ask Luciana that you email me that question because I think it's quite a specific one and I might need to think about it in a bit more detail rather than just off the cuff here and I wouldn't want to give you uh, any incorrect information. So please do drop me an email on that one if that's okay. Okay, the question is about uh, books, not journals. Does the author retain copyright of a book proposal if you cancel a contract or can that publisher give the book proposal to someone else to write? Um, no, the, if you write a book proposal um, and you don't end up publishing with that publisher, the publisher doesn't own that book proposal and couldn't then give that proposal that was your proposal that you'd written to another author to write a book based on your proposal. Um, that wouldn't that wouldn't happen if that's if that's what you do mean. Sorry, it's taken me uh, several attempts to get to what I think you now mean by that question. OK. I think now that is all the questions. Um, oh, wait, sorry. If the author has copyright to the author's accepted manuscript anyway, what's the advantage of rights retention? Is it just to bypass the embargo? Uh, yeah, effectively, yes, but to bypass any um, publisher terms that give restrictions on the use of that author's accepted manuscript. So it's not always just the, an embargo um, that the terms and conditions might might restrict the use of on the author's accepted version. And um, they often might say you can share it on a personal website, but not on uh, social media. Or they might say you can only email it to people. There, there can be all different kind of terms and conditions. Um, that publishers put into their copyright transfer agreements that stipulate how you can use that author's accepted version. Um, so the point of right retention is that you're licensing it CC BY, which means all reuse as long as there's attribution is allowed. And um, so it's not just to bypass the embargo period, but that's kind of the one of the most concrete examples of, of what, what can be avoided with right retention. Okay, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm gonna. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to change slide. Um, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, so thank you everyone for coming along today. Um, thank you for sticking with it through the the polls, and I hope you've all found that helpful. Um, if anyone does have any additional questions, and especially that particular one around uh music, um, please do feel free to drop me an email. But also, um, do speak to your copyright offices and uh people that work in those kind of areas at your own institutions as well. Um, as I'm sure they will have lots of um, other helpful um, suggestions and advice and guidance and things for you all. Okay, thank you very much.